Uh, we, we have all heard uh, uh, short introductions of the book. Now, Raja Mohan has obviously written a very important, thought-provoking book, and it is set to generate discussions, debates about uh, the future of Sino-Indian relations and also the impact of this uh, maritime rivalry, um, not only in the immediate neighborhoods, but far beyond. So to hear some early reactions to the book, some early responses, we are pleased to have with us a panel of our distinguished speakers to share their thoughts uh, on, on the book. Um, I will introduce them very briefly, but if you, I mean, these are all well-known individuals, but their brief bio data are in the uh, program details in your files. So I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking, starting from my extreme right. Uh, Mr. Kwa Chong Wan, who is a senior fellow at the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies and also an adjunct associate professor at the Department of History at NUS. Uh, Dr. Tim Huxley, who is the executive director of the IISS uh, Asia, based in Singapore. Uh, professor Cheng Yong Nian, who is the uh, director of the East Asian uh, Institute. And uh, Professor Kanti Bajpai, the vice uh, dean of research at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I'll request that each speaker present their thoughts in about 10 minutes uh, and then when all of them have spoken, we will have perhaps uh, between 30 and 40 minutes for a general discussion and I would like to hear your responses not only to the author's book but also to the uh, views expressed by the panelists. So without further ado, may I invite Chong Guan to kick off? Uh, thank you, Taeyong, and thanks to my whole colleague. Uh, for <coughs> inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I hope the remarks I'm going to make will not uh, upset him too much. Um, the first is about the intriguing title, which uh, Kobina Fili really referred to. It is basically the term refers to a uh, Vishnu creation myth, in which Vishnu uh, persuades the warring devas and asuras to cooperate to churn the cosmic ocean for the elixir of life umbrage. And uh, so it was uh, Devas and Asuras uh, agree and uh, Mount Miro is then uh, used as the churning stick to stir the cosmic ocean with the great Naga in Basuki all around it. And the Devas are lined up on the side, the head, and the Asuras on the other side, the tail end and they churn the ocean for a thousand years. And as they churn, the hero <coughs> slowly sinks into the ocean. At that point of time, uh, Vishnu in his uh, turtle avatar, Kumar, appears and dives into the ocean to support the uh, hero from sinking further. And uh, <coughs> then he also appears depending on which version of the myth you are living to, if you go by the best version in the great uh, Vishnu classic, the Bhagavata Purana, by chapter 7, Vishnu also appears at the top, uh, dancing on the top of the mountain, although some other variations, like I think the Shantapa Brahmana, it's uh, Indra who's pressing down the rod. And, uh, so, who are the Asuras and who are the Devas? It's quite clear to where you are. But who is Vishnu? Is it the US? <laughs> Who's presiding over this whole drama? And more important, depending on the variation of it, in this churning of the ocean, a very poisonous stuff comes up before the gates of life. And it almost overcomes the Asuras, the, the Devas, and the Asuras at the other end. The Asuras being a bit tougher, you know, don't need the help of Vishnu. Uh, or actually Shiva. Shiva appears to swallow up that poison and it's almost over himself. So if we go with that question, who is Lord Shiva who appears to swallow up that poison that comes out of this churning of the ocean? I'll leave that with you. Uh, I don't want to think about here. But um, let me go on to a couple of other points you make here. Briefly, the first one is about this theme from land lovers to sailors. 
And so the question I ask here, if that is so, if that is how Indian Chinese history is written, and Professor Wang Gangu has also emphasized on Chinese history, that basically a continental power trying to turn to the become a maritime power in like the US or Britain, Portugal, Spain, and Holland. Is it sustainable? Because in that comparative history, India turned to the sea only once in 1025 when the Cholas raided Southeast Asia, and China turned to the sea only once during the great era of the Ming voyages with her. And so, if we look at comparative history, the French were continental powers, the Germans, Tsarist Russia, more recently the Soviet Union. All of them did not make it. Will India and China, in that context of comparative history, make it as a maritime power? My second point, and time is running out here, is this turn to the sea. To what end is it for? To what end are we having building navies to, in the Mahanian version of <coughs> dominating blue oceans? The conventional wisdom, of course, is that it's for protecting of trade, that the sea is the medium on which flows transportation and trade. And, of course, it goes back the early modern era attributed to the water rally that uh, whosoever commands the sea commands the trade and whosoever commands the trade of the world commands the riches of the world and consequently the world itself. So that has been, I think, the conventional basis of wisdom of why we have navies to protect the waterways and trade and certainly in Singapore we appreciate this. This is what Lord Hastings authorized Stamper Brambles to do, establish a settlement of Singapore to protect the trade with China. And in India, you'll be familiar with the, I think Ajahn Wadi had used it before, the ghost of Lord Curzon, that India's security dependence of this important sanitaire in the Indian Ocean. And of course, if you come down to World War II, the images of Britain surviving because it had the Navy to protect those convoys across the Pacific. But, two points here in requisite. Number one, today, that whole economy, marine economy of shipping of goods trade is changing. Whereas the Royal Navy was protecting British ships, transporting British goods. Today, what is the commitment of the Indian or Chinese Navy to protecting ships that hypothetically may be owned by an Indian entrepreneur, but registered in Panama, Crewed by a motley group of people from Bangladesh, or Pakistan, and uh, sorry, Philippines, captained by maybe a Scotsman, transporting a cargo of goods from Myanmar, rice, to Singapore. The whole mechanics, the whole economy of shipping has changed. I think with that, the strategic significance has changed. The other is to separate the trade from naval domination. We want the rally and the early modern era onwards to get it. Go back before that. Um, for much of that pre-modern period, the ocean for the us in Asia, Indians, Chinese, was simply, and even Southeast Asian, open waters to be crossed. There was no idea, no issue of dominating it. So there was a very strong Indian maritime oceanic trade with Southeast Asia through the centuries, as with China. <coughs> and only in the two aberrant episodes of the Cholas and Chandra that we get in expeditions. Um, another second reason for <coughs> navies is to protect the sea as a resource. And here, I would say, in contrary to Bob Beckman, the unclos and the easy created may not have been a solution, but increasingly seen as the problem that he has created of needing to protect these and their resources, be it undersea, oil, or fisheries. And I'll leave it at that for the reason. The third possible 
reason for navies is they see as a medium for transmission of ideas and information that uh, in the early modern era, it's Christianity and the whole issue of uh, the Portuguese and the Dutch spreading, the uh, Portuguese spreading Christianity across the oceans and early in earlier era, Islam and even earlier Hindu Buddhism. Um, but today, I think the issues are different. Bob Beckman has been very strong on the whole issue of the security of undersea cables on which all our lives internet go. <coughs> it's not up there, it's down in the ocean, those cables. And as Bob Beckman will tell you, there are no provisions right now for the protection of those cables. No legislation, nothing. Ship strength to anchor actually pulls up those cables, or those cables are deliberately cut or whatever. So, is that an issue for navies? I leave it to you here to discuss. But I would say here that the uh, one you have given in your book, the basis of I think a very interesting research program, maritime research program, in which we in Southeast Asia and ASEAN, Singapore, should be looking at. Mr. Nathan gently hinted at it. But in this emerging rivalry, and this is an energy I use when we, in RSIS, discuss with an Indian Naval College staff. We discuss this, and this is no, no, no. Uh, it's not rivalry. Uh, if you take the analogy of a football team, both us and the Chinese are playing very defensive tactics. You know, uh, we are probing the other side for their strength, their tactics. We're not charging into the other side yet. Uh, case we shoot the ball across and see what happens. And you, ASEAN, could be the referee, the linesman, that waves between the two of us. I said, no, 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 that's not how we see it. Because if you take geography, then ASEAN is in the middle strip between the two of you. And either way, we are going to get trampled upon. Oh, how do you see it? I said, yes, and for that reason, we are very, very concerned about this. And I think there is the basis here for a sort of American studies program in which both RSIS and the uh, Southeast Studies can uh, work with here. Thank you. Thank you. In just about 11 minutes. Thank, thank you, Chong. Raja, I'll give you a chance to respond later on. Yeah, but sure. maybe we should hear from the other panelists first and I'm sure then we can put them all together. So uh, I'll now invite Dr. Tim Huxley to give us his views. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, ISAS for inviting me to make some, some I'd like to thank uh, ISAS for inviting me to make some, some brief comments. Um, Roger Mohan's uh, book, Samudra Mantan, uh, examines one of the most important themes in contemporary Asian security affairs, uh, the question of the emergent strategic rivalry between, uh, between what are the world's two most populous countries, and um, of course there is this specific focus on, on the maritime dimensions of this rivalry. He's, he's provided a very detailed analysis of the geopolitics of the naval expansion programs of China and India, including efforts to expand uh, India's uh, naval reach into the Pacific and, and China's growing, evidently growing interest in the Indian Ocean. Um, so he, he, he highlights the extent to, to which uh, Indian and, and Chinese naval activities are increasingly overlapping and coming into contact with each other. And he also looks at the questions of, of island bases and, and the very uh, important competition for influence around the, the littorals of the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. And he looks very importantly in, in great detail at efforts to mitigate the what he calls the Sino-Indian security dilemma through ex exploratory confidence-building measures. And as, as one would expect, this is a very nicely written and extremely readable book, uh, which uses, uh, where applicable, uh, certain international relations concepts, but is not, uh, in contrast to uh, many more academic books, it's not, it's not in awe of of international relations concepts. And for, for example, in Rajamohan's chapter on ordering the Asia, oh, sorry, ordering the Indo-Pacific, 
he makes the extremely worthwhile point that the real world does not adhere to neatly structured concepts from political theory. And he goes on to observe that decision makers in China and India are likely to pursue cooperative security and Asian concert and the balance of power simultaneously. And I think that's a very astute observation on the, real, on the way that the, the, the real world of foreign and security policy works, which uh, often does not fit into the neat categories that uh, many academics would like it to. I think the book's most important argument is that the, the nature of the US relationship with China and India and the unfolding dynamic between Beijing and New Delhi are likely to be the principal determinants of the future security order in the Indo-Pacific region. In his concluding chapter, Rajmohan uh, assesses what he refers to as the, um, the strategic triangle involving the United States, India, and China, and its potential impact on the region. That, is, that I think, is a masterly chapter, and would alone make this book a worthwhile read. And he notes particularly the difficulties that Washington and New Delhi face in translating their convergent interests into an effective coalition, which I think is a very realistic and important observation. Uh, by the way, just one sideline. I, I was quite um, enthralled by the way that Raj Mohan uh, uh, makes fairly extensive references in the book to the work of the great uh, historian and, and naval strategist K.M. Panicker. Um, Panicker was, was a man um, of remarkable vision and as, as far as I know, incidentally, was, was the first writer in the English language uh, on international relations anywhere to use the term Southeast Asia, and that was in 1943. I think even before Mountbatten's command was, uh, was established. And I mean, the term had been used in German uh, um, maybe 40 or 50 years earlier, but that was the first usage in the, in the English language. Uh, I think this is an, an authority authoritative and, and overall an extremely persuasive volume. It's also a stimulating book and it provokes a number of questions for me. Um, I'll mention just a couple of these. In the first place, um, I must say that I, having read the book, I do wonder about this question of the substantial asymmetry in the relationship between India and China and what this could mean in the long term in, in terms of their economic size, their rate of growth, and by many, many economic and social indices, um, and uh, let alone the scale of their defense spending and the, and, uh, the, the divergent spending on military R&D between India and China. China has huge advantages over India. I think that has to be faced. Uh, well, you, you can argue, uh, as, um, as Raj Mohan does in this book, that this asymmetry provides, as it were, a, prima facie case for closer strategic relations on India's part with the United States. Um, but I wonder what are the implications for India's power and influence if China does continue to grow inexorably and at the same time the United States is seriously hobbled by long-term economic and ultimately uh, military uh, weakness in terms of its capacity to project power into this, this region. And that leads me on to a second question. The book focuses on Sino-Indian rivalry and on the US regional security role, but what about the Indo-Pacific's prosperous and increasingly well-armed medium powers? My own sense is that Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Australia could well play more assertive and important roles in regional security in the coming years and decades, with the result that the Indo-Pacific may become much more evidently multipolar. Uh, I think it's worth remembering K.M. Panikkar's vision as early as 1943 of India collaborating with Indonesia to maintain security in Southeast Asia. So, so, so I suppose the second question uh, for me is uh, what part might India's relations, particularly in the naval sphere, with these regional medium powers play in the emerging regional order. Uh, this, is the, this is the focus, of, of course, of the book's chapter six um, on India's Pacific ambitions. Um, but I think it does provoke the question um, of, of 
where is India's strategic engagement with, with Southeast Asia uh, going? And why has it been so episodic and, as Roger Mohan says, fitful so far? Because in this part of the world, I think it's true that India is seen as a, as a benign and essentially unthreatening power. Uh, but despite some uh, quite interesting developments in India's strategic relations with individual Southeast Asian countries over the last half decade, half decade or so, I think India's regional role still seems relatively unimpressive and undeveloped next to China's. And on that note, uh, I'll stop, apart from saying again that I think this is an impressive book that all concerned with the major power dynamics of Asia should read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Now, perhaps a, a view from uh, the Chinese side, but uh, in the end, of course, based in Singapore, he doesn't represent the Chinese view, but he will give us some good insights uh, from the Chinese perspective. So, what do you think? I've tried. But it's more difficult to, to represent China as such a big country. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Raja Mohan for such an uh, excellent book. And uh, I really I enjoy reading it. I think this is the first book I, I, I read, I have read. And it's a very systematic analysis of China uh, India strategic relations. And it's wonderful. I think uh, and it's a very, very balanced. Uh, analysis and uh, about China and India. And, uh, first of all, I would say Raja is uh, a dualist enough. I think he he, he identified all kind of source, potential source for India uh, China rivalry competition. And uh, and uh, as already mentioned, uh, and, uh, both country are growing and uh, both country are part of nationalistic and uh, both country you know. Have, uh, <coughs> Greater now, increasing energy demand, all kind of source, and the pushing those two countries into to become a moving time and power. It's a very important. But also, I think you know it's a balance because he also is is idealistic, quite a, quite a nice, and he also identified a potential area for cooperation. How the two great power can deal with issue, can work together. I think it's, a, it's a, unlike uh, some other books, you know, focus on only rival side or, or cooperation side. It's very much uh, balanced. I, think I, li I like it. It's a combination of realism uh, and dualism. Even he uh, didn't refuse to use this kind of international relation literature term. But here I would like to, not, not to, uh, not, will not be able to represent China, but uh, I will make a few points uh, based on my own observation and my own understanding of China, particularly its culture and its people. Yeah. My first point is, uh, you know, I'm thinking about whether China really is able to become a maritime power you know, turn to see. Of course, uh, in listening year, you know, a lot of debate in China and a lot of argument in you know, China should become a maritime power. But whether China will be able to become one is a big question. I think ever since the Ming Dynasty, and if we look back to Chinese history, a lot of debate whether China should turn to the sea or, or focus on land. I, I think this issue is not solved even until today. Still a lot of debate. Because uh, it's uh, very simple. The British became a maritime power because of its simple geographical factors. The United States, the same, you know, very, very simple geographic constraint. But for China, China because it is surrounded by dozens of, of countries, and, and it's very difficult for China to become a maritime power. Even today, if you look at China's west side, you know, Xinjiang, Tibet, Central Asia, Russia, you know, all uh, constraint factors, constrain, you know, and they, and they constrain China to, uh, to become a long-term power. A lot of debate even today, uh, even even in recent year, particularly when China now is having difficulty with Japan in, in the East Coast side, and many scholars have uh, been debating 
or that should, China should have formally should have a look west policy. That means still focus on Central Asia and the Middle East because also China is a major, uh, major. I mean, what to say, and the energy uh, imported from from Middle East. And China certainly has a reason to focus on uh, this ban or limited strategy. So uh, I would say it's too early to judge whether China really will put on you know, all his emphasis on, on going time and power. My second uh, point is, uh, I would say, whether China will, well, somehow I feel, because Raja uh, compared China on the other great power uh, history, but I think China is not fixed as a great power. China is, what, what China is now trying to learn to be a great power. And uh, since I think the fall of the Soviet Union, I think China is still is a learning state. China has learned from the Soviet Union a lot. So I, when I go over all kind of literature, how China is trying to learn from both the Soviet Union and the United States, I found it quite an interesting point. For example, their conclusion is like, the Soviet type of, of, of expressionism does not work, and the Soviet Union type of socialism with poverty doesn't work. So, so this, this, for China, still the leadership, uh, its top priority is still domestic development because they know why the United States has become so strong. Not because of the United States Navy power or Air Force, but because of the United States economic power. You know, it's, it's a big economy, so it's very, very important. Also, they also you know, have learned you know, after the, uh, after this, you know, after the fall of Soviet Union, Union, why the United States began to decline, also because of its, its economy, not because of its, its military. So I, I would say so for, for the foreseeable future, as China, the Chinese leadership will continue to focus on its domestic development, not, not foreign policy. If you look at the foreign policy structure, really in China, I always say very sympathetic about China's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs because in all other countries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is so important because China in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs does, 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 not, have, does not have any substantial power. The, the power structure for, for is not there for a great power. Is, is not, not there. So also China also learning, for example, and uh, uh, I, I saw lots of literature to argue why democracy become a biggest burden for, for the United States. So China doesn't want to, to, to have its own ideological sense for, for, for other countries. And uh, as, as, as the other part I want to see, because Raja uh, mentioned that both China and India are civilizational states. So I wish you know, Raja could uh, look into the civilization side, really. China is not a Western type of nation state yet. It's a still a civilizational state. If we look at the tradition, China is, a, is a not a, China was not a missionary power. Chinese culture, just like Indian culture, are quite inclusive, not, not, not exclusive. Them, so it can accommodate and as a as as a powers that I think uh, matters a lot. Even now, I I, I think it's because the Raja did, did not look into the ideological side, but personally I feel you know, in terms of foreign policy uh, or international strategy, the ideological sense is still very important. And there's ever since Deng Xiaoping, the leadership has been trying to form a new ideology, what Deng Xiaoping so-called Tao Guang Yang Hui, the low profile policy. Later on, China proposes so-called peaceful development, or peaceful uh, uh, rise. But latest, the new concept is the so-called new type of great power relations. Well, you might be suspicious about this uh, ideology, you know, whether this is ideally work or not. But the issues, I, I see the point, because the leadership wanted to, to use uh, this ideology to unify what this typical Chinese Communist Party propaganda, to unify you know, the sort of, of different sectors of society, the military and you know, the different, different government agencies, you know, because China wanted peace, wanted peace. But this kind of sense is quite a bit useful, uh, useful, very interesting if you look at that. 
So last time, actually, I went to I went to I went to uh, Yunnan University to have a change, and some uh, a young fellow uh, complained because he's a uh, India expert, and he actually published quite a number of articles about China India and the relations. <coughs> but he was, uh, I mean. Uh, he, he, he tried to find a job in the Institute of South Asia Studies, but he was rejected. I asked why, because he, he, he wrote some artic article very critical about India, so, so the Institute refused, refused him. No, I asked why, because this is Chinese typical mentality. I think if uh, people, he would tell, that if you want to, to, to study India, if you want to be a great scholar of India, you must love India first. <laughs> if you have critique about India, you have no way. This is a particular Chinese mindset. So people, I heard a, a lot complain. If you, you, you know, in China, if you, you're a scholar on United States, you must prove United States. On Japan, you must prove Japan. <laughs> so this is this is very interesting uh, phenomenon. If, so I would say overall, overall, of course, if you look at the media, you know, people will say, "Oh, that's awful. China, India are going to have a war." Or whatever. But actually, the Chinese population, and the major population, is so Indian friendly. They admire India's civilization, Buddhism, all kinds of stuff. Really, I don't say this anti-India sentiment there. Only, only a few journalists, well, I would say it's a commercial nationalism, you know, because they publish the kind of thing, they can attract lots of eyes from <coughs> China. So I think, basically, China, India, I don't think it will repeat in the other what uh, the older experience of uh, as a, the rise of uh, as a older great power. If we look at that, uh, well, I mentioned uh, the ideological fact, factor, if we look at the uh, German or uh, Japan before World War II, then really those country uh, had a form, at that time formed a new type of the ideology, imperialism, expressionism. But uh, in today's China, you don't see any kind of like that. But, uh, the, the, the ideology, the leadership they're trying to form is quite opposite. So that's not Before I ask Kanti, I just want to make a point of clarification. The Institute of South Asian Studies that Yongnian referred to that rejected a young man who didn't love India was not our institute. <laughs> that's, that's an institute that's based in Yunnan. Uh, we don't require all our scholars to learn India. It's nice if they do, but uh, just to understand India. So I just